to get two nuts and bolts in the trial side. Um, well, there was no trial. He just pled guilty. Okay. Yeah. Did you? Uh, um, but I did go to court. Okay. Okay. So you did testify and and shared. Um, all I uh, I gave my victim impact statement. Right. Um, at sentencing, I mean, even those few months leading up to that, I mean, that was just a a whirlwind to go from nobody knowing to one person knowing, which was huge, to a handful of people knowing. And then the more I thought about it, I and all of us thought about it, um, we wanted to be the ones to tell our story. And so myself and the um, April and the other survivor that came forward, um, we told our stories on Facebook um, mm-hmm. the weekend after or the day after he was arrested. And it all just kind of happened very, very quickly <laughs> that you go from nobody knowing to thousands of people knowing in a matter of weeks. And you're still kind of processing what even happened yeah. <laughs> and still learning about what even happened. And uh, it was also that time. I mean, I, I remember the night that he was arrested and my detective, you know, was going to warn me that there was going to be a press release. And I remember thinking like, this isn't going to be on the news, is it? And he was like, eh, well, I mean, we are near LA County. Like it, it might get kind of big. And he's like, but you know, you don't need to worry about it. Like, it's fine. And I'm like, yeah, it's not going to be a big deal. And within, I mean, 48 hours, it was on every major news network in Southern California. And that was just a lot to take in. And um, also at that time, I had filed a lawsuit against my church. And some of the news networks accessed my lawsuit and even used my name without my permission with details of my abuse in different um, news stations. I mean, things that I I, I haven't even been able to tell my husband the extent of it. And he's learning it on the news. Like it was, it was bad (laughs) and no one, I mean, there's no manual on how to deal with this and Mm seeing your abuser's mugshot all over the news and your name attached to it with details of your abuse. Um, yeah, that was not expected and that was very difficult. Um, but now I know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I know we're kind of getting near the end, but I'm curious, um, giving your uh, victim impact statement, like what was the emotion you felt at that point? Cause obviously now you're ending this chat like that. That's a very, formal ending of this chapter of this horrible, I mean, years of trauma. Um, what did you feel at that moment? Be able to like actually look him in the eyes and say, this is what happened. This is what you really did. Um, I mean, I worked on it for a long time um, because I knew, you know, this is it. This is my only chance to say anything. And as I wanted him to know how much he hurt me. I also wanted the church to know how much they hurt me and their reaction or lack thereof um, was extremely hurtful as well. And I also like, I, I felt like I needed to show because there was a lot of girls that did not speak up. Um, There was seven of us that came forward to the police Mm -hmm there was three of us that pressed charges and there was probably 20 more that either opened up to me or opened up to April, but said they don't want to get involved. And that was really hard (laughs) to process that. Like, I mean, he was only sentenced to five years in prison and he's up for parole in April. And knowing just how bad it really was, but on paper, it only showed three victims. Um, only that, I mean, one is worth Which even that. that you would expect more than five years. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but I, I felt like I needed to show them, like, I know we're broken, 
I know that he hurt us and we're still processing this, but he can't control it anymore. And so I did feel like I needed to be strong and to show them and everybody else that you can be broken, but you can build yourself up again. Mm. And it's, it's possible. And so I, I mean, I was very proud of my impact statement and God really did help me give me the strength. And it's funny because when we were sitting in there waiting for the judge to come in and stuff, our detective walked over and he's like, Hey girls, you know, I moved the podium over there so that you don't have to look at him, you know, so you can face over here, the judge. So you don't have to see him when he comes in. And all of us like kind of looked at each other, like, and look back at him. We're like, why? He's like, well, you don't want to look at him, do you? And we're like, uh, no, we want him to look in our eyes and see exactly what he did. And he was like, oh, oh, okay, well, I'll go fix it. And I mean, it was one of the most beautiful things and heartbreaking things all at the same time to just watch these girls go up there and talk about, you know, what he put us through, but know that justice is happening right now as we as we're speaking and um i from where i was standing his attorney did stand directly in front of him so that we won't he won't have to see us uh which was a very cowardly move in my opinion and um but family members from the other side said that the entire time we were giving our impact statements um he was either laughing or shaking his head in disagreement and I don't really understand that. Um, like you literally admitted it. <laughs> um, there's nothing funny anymore happening. And even when the judge asked him, is there anything, you know, for that you want to say to the victims and their survive and their families? And he said, no, he didn't want to say anything. And it, that was, I think hard because I think I was expecting to see remorse after everything that's happened and that did not happen. Um, Instead, he's laughing and shaking his head as we talk about the traumatic things that he put us through as kids. And yeah, that was, that was very difficult to see, but I walked out and he didn't. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I think that's an awesome place. I know there's a lot of stuff going on now with the, with the lawsuit and everything, which we, you know, there's not much to say right now to, to dive into just yet, but um, you have become, you know, very vocal about, you know, abuse within the independent Baptist movement. You've seen it obviously, and you know, that it is a big problem and you become very outspoken and, um, you know, a, an advocate for lack of a better word. I always feel like words like that, you know, don't have a lot of meaning, but you really have been an, an advocate for survivors and have made yourself, you know, really squared off against this movement. So I'm curious, like what, what's pushing you to keep, you know, keep being so vocal about this, you know, obviously your case has been as much legally as can happen with it has happened. Um, but now you're really taking time to help other people and to, uh, just keep raising the alarm on this. What's motivating you to keep pushing into that kind of advocate role as opposed to setting this on the shelf and trying to move on and, and go forward from there? I mean, I, I think there's something beautiful in finding your voice and you realize just how brave you actually are. And, um, but I think a lot of it, honestly, um, is I'm going to start crying. Um, My relationship with God now. I feel like I spent so many years um, hating him (laughs) and hating him and blaming him for what I went through at the hands of someone that represented him. And I really struggled with what God is. And during the investigation when I was just at my lowest and everything was just happening very quickly. I mean, I, I told God, like, you're the one that made this mess. You need to be the one to fix it. And if you can fix it, 
then we can do this. Then we can work together. And I felt like through the investigation, through the many people that I've talked to, through the many girls that I talked to, um, I feel like I found this like strange, unique community of people that were hurt at the hands of someone that represented God and their church did absolutely nothing about it and made it worse. And when you're hurt in an environment like that, yes, you can, you know, you, you can hate yourself. You can hate your abuser. You can hate your environment. But unfortunately the other person that gets a lot of hatred is God. And, um, it sucks, but that's, that's just how it is. And I felt like he revealed himself to me in one of the realest ways that I could have ever seen. And he fought for my justice and he fought for my freedom. And I felt like he showed me this role that had not been filled yet at that mm. point. Yeah. Um, for people that have been through abuse, have been through sexual abuse, um, spiritual abuse, and still believe in him and still want to make him look good despite all of the bad that has happened. And so I, I really do believe and I really do feel like God kind of put me in that position and gave me this role. And there's too many people I can't disappoint now. And too many people that I know, um, you know, I'm, and I'm not saying this in a way to brag on myself. I'm saying it in a way to brag on God because that's what he can do in people's lives. And that these monsters that made him look like a fool um, is not him. And the people that are protecting them and the people that are wanting to act like this never happened um, need to be exposed yeah. and need to be called out and need to be in jail <laughs> for what they have done. And so to answer your question, I feel like I found the purpose and the passion that I was looking for. And I didn't think it would be the worst time of my life <laughs> that mm. I would be passionate about, but that is what God has kind of given me. And I don't want to mess that up now. Kind of given me and I don't want to mess that up now. I, I, I always ask this question at the end. I think we're leading right into it, but I, I just have to know. So do you think that there's hope for reform of the IFP movement itself? Or do you think it's something that needs to be put to rest? Hence it's, it's broken. Um, what do you hope to see as a result of your kind of advocacy work in this area? I mean, I am not here to say that every IFB church needs to be closed down. I've had great conversations with different pastors and different church leaders that are still involved and very much still associate themselves with the IFB. And I don't think their churches need to be closed down. Um, I do wish that I mean, even just five years ago, the conversation of abuse was not one that was taken seriously and, or it was just not discussed at all. And that's not just, um, I feel like, yes, specifically in the church, but I mean, also society, I feel like is changing with their views towards abuse and things like that. But for specifically with church, it was something before that was so brushed off with um, that's gossip. That's rumors. We're not talking about that. Well, if you don't talk about it, it's never going to get fixed. If you don't talk about it, um, there won't be, there won't ever be any change. And so do I wish that every IFB church is closed? No, absolutely not. But I do wish that with how public, um, myself and many others are being with our experience, um, not just with our abusers, but also with the churches that completely failed us, that it can show the next pastor that if anything were to happen now they know what to do and now they definitely know what not to do. And I mean, we can't, you, you can't stop a, you can, but you can't stop a sexual predator. They they are going to find their way in a church, unfortunately in a school and a, you name it, but how you react and how your church is set up will predict how far they can get. And I just hope that our, um, 
everything that we're talking about can prevent that from ever happening again. Okay. And so in a long answer, no, I don't think they can, they should be closed, but I do think that there's a lot of things that we can fix so that another victor does not happen again. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I don't want to add too much because I feel like you kind of said <laughs> everything that could be said. Um, but I appreciate you sharing. I mean, I know this was a, a long conversation and, you know, I feel like we covered really everything. Um, but I just appreciate you sharing and not, you know, just not letting this sit where it is and, and for using your voice to kind of share your story and to inspire other people to share theirs and to encourage pastors to be aware of this stuff. And um, I just want you to know, and I know I speak for people listening as well. Like I don't take it lightly that you just had this conversation and I don't take it lightly that you just spent three hours talking about literally the worst experience of your life. Um, and um I, I appreciate you a lot and I appreciate um, just the work that you've been doing. I appreciate you sharing and um, yeah, I just thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. A year after Victor went to prison, Rachel was given the opportunity to speak at a Senate hearing in Indiana in favor of changing the statute of limitations on sexual assault in Indiana. Just identify yourself and if you represent anybody. Hello, I am Rachel Peach. I'm from Northwest Indiana as well. My husband, Dan, and I live in Hobart, Indiana, and thank you all for meeting with us today. According to the Indiana State Department of Health's Trauma Times, dated September, October 2018, emergency health facilities statewide treated 8,273 confirmed sexual assault cases in our state in 2016 to 2017. In the majority of these cases, the victim was between the ages of 15 and 17 years old. I was 15 years old when I was raped for the first time. I was continually abused by the same man, and sexual abuse became the new normal for me. I learned to live with it and block out the trauma. In March 2018, the BBC conducted a study to determine that 90% of sexual assault victims know their attacker whether that attacker is a family member, a teacher, a coach, or in my case, my church youth pastor. These predators often use their authoritative power to instill fear as a tactic to silence their victims. But the indisputable certainty is that these kids grow up. They don't stay 15-year-old scared children forever. We become adults and with that maturity comes the understanding of what was happening to us as innocent children was completely wrong. When we finally gain the strength to come forward about the evil that was done to us, the one thing we could hope for is that the law would protect victims rather than the predators. Victims of sexual assault in Indiana deserve a voice. They deserve the ability to stand for themselves, to face their abuser, and to have the law on their side. The last thing that should be on the mind of a courageous victim willing to speak up should be, I wish I had said something sooner. These thoughts of guilt are placed on the wrong person when time and the law become their enemy. When a victim finally takes the first steps towards getting help and begins the process of healing, the last thing they need to hear is that there's nothing that can be done. Today, we have an opportunity to stand with victims and to show our wonderful country that Indiana does not tolerate sexual assault of any kind, and we are willing to do something about it now. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.